Hi everyone, this is Ariki Spencer and we're here again for our Sociology of Media Voices series. Today, um, we're interviewing someone whom I have admired for many years. Someone who has also been influential in my work as a teacher, educator and now a researcher in the field of justice education. Jane Caro is somebody who has changed the landscape in terms of providing a voice for women, but also for society in terms of justice in our education system. She is a member of the Order of Australia. She is an academic. She is an acclaimed writer and she's written over 12 books. She's also presented. She has her own consultancy series. I could go on and on, but um, I'd just like you all to know the privilege of hearing from Jane herself. Welcome, Jane. Thank you very much, Rick. Um, I'm not an academic anymore. I did, I did walk out of work, working in universities, um, not because I didn't like it. I did, but it was the one rigid thing in a very fluid life. And uh, so in the end, I had to make a decision and I went with the fluidity rather than the rigidity. And mm. um, there's probably a bit of a metaphor for that going through my life to some extent. Mm. Um, tell me what you want me to talk about. What well, do you think hear would about be Jane. Let's hear about Jane. Let's go back and let's explore Jane. Uh, what sort of influences you when you were a young person at school to, like, say, what sort of things were around at the time when you were at school shaping your ideas about being a woman in, in society in Australia? Well, I was um, at school, um, primary school in the 1960s and high school in the 1970s. And I guess that was really fortunate for me. Um, it was a matter of lucky timing because they were times of great change, huge change. Um, particularly for women, I think, uh, because I think you can actually mark the beginnings of the second wave of um, women's liberation from the um, invention of the pill, because that gave um, heterosexual, biologically female women um, control over their fertility for the first time in history, really reliable control over their own fertility, and that had a revolutionary effect mm. on what could do in the world because you have to be able to control your own body before you can control your own life, which is, of course, why reproductive rights are such an essential part of feminism. Um, so I was radicalised, really, uh, by the older women in my life. Um, my mother was a feminist, always a feminist. She was a member of the women's electoral lobby. Uh, she... Uh, spoke passionately about her beliefs in women's rights and her resentment at not having had the education that she uh, wanted and also would have excelled at. I mean, my mother should have been an historian. Um, she does do it now as a 90-year-old. She gives lectures wow. in, at the University of the Third Age um, and she's brilliant. But she never got those opportunities, mostly because of her gender, partly because of her class. She was a uh, lower middle class girl, upper working class maybe, uh, brought up, born and brought up in Manchester in England. Um, and that also, class is also something that was instilled into me as um, really important. And we live in a country which claims to be classless. But, of course, that's absolute mm. horseshit. You only have to look around to see that. And, um, in fact, one of the things that um, infuriates me is that we, almost alone in Western democracies, in fact, I think the almost is redundant there, alone in Western democracies, is using our education system to build a class system. Mm. Um, education systems are mostly used to... Um, actually reduce the class system, but not in Australia, no. So here we fund them publicly so that we can create an upper class and a lower class. That's how our education system actually works. So I think probably a lot of my um, politics were formed by my parents' Mancunian roots. And, of course, Manchester is the most um, bolshy and uh, mm. kind of... Um, um, left wing of the English um, 
regional cities. Mm -hmm. It's the birthplace of the Guardian, which used to be called the Manchester Guardian, of course. And uh, I, I think that heritage is part of, I imbibed it with my mother's milk, um, along with um, a strong commitment to feminism. And my mother was also an activist. She, um, she helped, was part of the group that helped save um, Duffy's Forest from having a small light aircraft. Duffy's Forest in Sydney is on the edge of the Karingai National Park. And mm. so uh, the local community fought, fought very hard in the 1970s to stop uh, an airport being built um, on the edge of that um, extremely important national park. And so she was an, also an early environmentalist. And, you know, it's, it's you know, I can't claim any credit in a way for my commitment to social justice and my um, political beliefs because I got them from my parents. My father was a very successful businessman. He worked for multinational corporations and rose to the top of the ladder. But along the way, he promoted women. He uh, felt very strongly that uh, women were fully equal to men. He was quite unusual for his era right. in the respect and um, uh, love and, and equality that he had for his wife. My mother was and still is, they're both 90 now, my parents and Hale and Hearty, the most important woman in my father's life, the most important person in his life. And um, he really thought her brain was splendid and um, was incredibly proud of anything that she did. This was an enormous gift um, to his daughters growing up in the 60s and 70s to see a, um, a man who had that view of his wife. I often, there's a saying I really like, which is, you know, anonymous. And as Virginia Woolf said, anonymous is a woman. Um, it's by anonymous and it is um, the most important thing a man can do for his children is love their mother. And um, my father definitely did that. It's interesting, I've actually kind of valorised or adapted that saying sometimes um, when I'm arguing on behalf of teachers that the most important thing a society can do for its children is love their teachers because mm. it has always struck me as fundamentally absurd that we would expect um, the educational outcomes to improve while we um, systematically drive down the morale of the teaching profession and make them feel uh, that they are disrespected. I don't see how those two things can go together at all. And yet that seems to be the way we manage these things. So I, I, um, I was just a very ordinary middle-class, white middle-class privilege, no, no question about that. You know, we never lack for money. Um, my father rose uh, to uh, earn a really good income eventually. I'm the eldest of four, two sisters and a brother. Um, I, I grew up in French's Forest and Terry Hills. I went to Forest High um, at a time when anyone who went to a private school was seen as a bit weird, like everybody went to the local public school. And, and in fact, it was really quite interesting because of course the seventies were the era when boys grew their hair long for the first mm -hmm. time. And it was really, you know, revolutionary. And nobody wanted to go to a private school because all the boys had to wear a short back and sides. So it was like the uncoolest place you could possibly attend. So I've never quite gotten over that. And I can never understand it when people boast to me about sending to a, their kids to a private school. I always think to myself, how odd. Why, why on earth would you want to do a thing like that? Mm -hmm. um, which was exactly how I regarded it when I was a teenager. And we could have short hair, skirts and long hair. And my friends at private schools had to wear daddy skirts to their knees and short back and sides. I'm always, I've, I, I, that image has remained with me. Um, but yeah, I was formed by my parents' uh, strong belief in social justice. My parents always um, said to us, you are privileged, you are fortunate. There is an obligation that comes with privilege and that is to share your privilege, to spread it as widely as you can. The wrong thing to do with privilege is to try and hold on to it only for yourself and people like you. The right thing to do with privilege, which is a fundamentally unfair thing to have when it's only you who has it, is to spread it as widely as you can. And so I guess I, I was a good student of my parents' values. 
Mm. What was it like for you, Jane, when you finished Year 12? What were the choices like for women then in terms of careers or going to university? Well, we called it sixth form back in the dark ages. Um, well, for me, as, a, as I say, a middle-class girl, even though I wasn't a particularly brilliant student, I was very good at English, but I was much more interested in having a good time and flirting with boys than I was in studying. Um, and in those days, that was sort of, people were much more relaxed about mm. uh, academic achievement than they are now. Funnily enough, I think we actually achieved better and they were mm. more relaxed about it, paradoxically. Um, so I really didn't have all that much choice. I got a Commonwealth scholarship. So um, it turned out that that was in a way redundant because when I started university in 19, I finished school in 1974. So I started university in 1975. It mm -hmm. was the Whitlam era and the university right. was free. Okay. So I got a, a bit about the audience, especially younger people who don't understand, they always live with hex. So, at university you could you obtained a place at university and in terms of the payment what was what was that uh for you jane no payment okay zero zero it was free whitlam made university free uh, when he came into power in 1972 so i was the lucky beneficiary of that and so was my mother one of the things oh. we do not talk about is that um i heard someone it might have been christopher pine i think on hmm. Q&A and it was one of the many times when I yelled at him when he was on Q&A I wasn't I was just yelling at the TV screen by the way <laughs> anyway, we we're just watching but um he uh said oh you know that was ridiculous it was mostly middle class people that accessed uh the free university now there was there is some truth to that but what he didn't talk about was that the huge opportunity that it gave to what were then called probably still are mature age students mm. who had been denied a university education when they were younger because when it was expensive um it was the boys the your brother who got the opportunity to go in a family with limited resources the girls never got to go and so it was very very privileged who went you girls who went to university before that when whitlam made it free there was a flood of mature age women into the universities who had been denied that opportunity. And one of them was my mother. Um, and they were, I often think now looking at um, a lot of the women who made it to the top in, in um, Annabelle Crabbe's Ms. Represented documentary, we see a few of them. Um, yes. They were a cohort of women who got a, a university degree later in life thanks to the Whitlam reforms. We often don't realise the effect that things like that have, in mm. a way, the unintended consequences. And that really helped turbocharge, I think, um, women getting more positions of power and authority in Australian life in the 70s. Um, mm. It wasn't us young undergraduates. We got opportunities too that hadn't been available to girls just five, ten years older than I am. But our mothers and our older sisters got opportunities that they had previously been denied. Um, this made a huge difference. And Jane, when I left, yeah, when I left, I just I had a fairly ordinary degree. I knew I wanted to do the English literature, and I know I'm a champion of teachers, but I never wanted to be a teacher. Um, so I just went and did a straight English literature degree because. I, I had been brought up to believe that university was not a technical college where you trained to get a, a job, but it was in fact a place you went to expand your um, knowledge base, your learning, and to learn more about the things that you really were interested in. And for me, that was English literature. Mm -hmm. Jane, I want to get your opinion, um, your view on why is it that governments, we have now positioned education universities as one of the most expensive, I guess, decisions anyone can make of a commitment to do a course. And I, the, the average course now, well, it's changed now with the, obviously, with some arts degrees being priced, but say on thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. Why is it that governments know that these are debts and no one actually looks at the implications of young people accruing these huge hex debts? So why is it that we are, don't change that? Why is it that Whitlam's way, we can't go back to having free education? Why is it that we have to put a price on that? 
I think it's got to do with uh, neoliberalism, with economic rationalism, and basically what that, I believe, pernicious philosophy has done is it's um, perpetuated the myth, the scarcity myth, that there's not enough to go around. Mm. And so if there isn't enough to go around, then we all have to fight each other for the little bit that we can get. And what that does is that creates a kind of um, horrible competitive ladder where people have to fight really hard to get their opportunity because the, after all, there's not enough to go around. We can't give it to everybody. And this creates um, inevitably a society made up of winners and losers. And by and large, we, we then perpetuate, so we have a we have a myth that there isn't enough to go around, which isn't true. Uh, well, there is enough to go around. We just have governments that prioritise tax cuts for the top end of town um, and then like to bring in robo-debt to squeeze every last red cent out of people who haven't got anything. So that is a choice made by governments. It's We, we could fund all sorts of things that we choose not to fund. Mm -hmm. um, these are about priorities. So there is enough to go around. So that's the scarcity myth is wrong right from the start. But then we add to the scarcity myth, the merit myth, that people get ahead on merit. We have this idea that if you work hard and study hard and are good, you'll get ahead. Well, that's not true either. I mean, if it was true, the people who do get ahead would be far more impressive in our community than they actually are. Mm -hmm. um, because I challenge anyone to look at our leaders currently and say that most of them got there on merit. Um, most of them get there on privilege. So merit has become a, a way of excusing privilege. And by privilege, I mean inherited privilege. And there are all kinds of inherited privilege. There's the inherited privilege of being white. There's the inherited privilege of being male. There's the inherited privilege of being um, heterosexual. There's the inherited privilege um, of being middle class. There's the inherited privilege of having um, highly educated parents mm. because one of the things we know is the biggest predictor of success academically. People say, oh, it's socioeconomic status. Mm, to some extent, yes. But actually, funnily enough, it's mother's educational level. So if mm. you are born to a university graduate mother, you are likely to do well at school. And so there are all kinds of inherited privileges. Nothing wrong with it. You can't help any of those things. You were kind of born into it. But it, you have an obligation to understand what your privilege is and not to call it merit, which is adding insult to injury because you are then claiming credit for things that you have no right to claim credit for. So um, going on to that, Jane, I'm really interested. Let's take a, a, a part of step now further what why do we so invest governments invest so much in this system of public and private schooling why is it that in one way governments say everyone is equal we can all get into if, we, if we're good enough but why does the government still invest so much in the private school system why not have one system well i actually um, I have no proof of any of this or any data. So this is just lived experience and my gut mm. feel, but, and thinking it through. Um, my view is that when the 70s happened and there was a breaking down of the rigid barriers between men and women, I mean, the, the, very, the, the fact that boys grew their hair long absolutely horrified their fathers and grandfathers' generation quite disproportionately. It was just a fashion, but it indicated something. It indicated that the old rigid patriarchy was starting to crumble. It was important symbolically. That was then followed by um, an influx of women into education, women, people of colour, et cetera, et cetera, then gay rights, all those kinds of things all kind of happened around the same time. And religion started to lose its hold on the so-called moral basis of society. And I think that at that time in the 70s and early 80s, the right had a huge fright. They got a real scare. And I think a lot of them organised. Um, and I don't mean this in a conspiracy way. I mean, I think they got together and said, well, we can't let this continue to happen. And so they started to stand for office. And the left kind of went, oh, we're just having a great fun, having a party here. And, you know, we don't need to worry too much. And so they thought they'd won and um, just went off and celebrated. And meanwhile, the right got busy. And so what we have now is a fight, I think. Um, I call it between the 
liberals, and by that I do not mean the Liberal National Party, I mean the small L liberal, the people who um, let live and let live. You know, they're, they're the, they're, the number of Australians who have a liberal view of the world was demonstrated by the overwhelming approval of um, same-sex marriage, for example. Mm. Um, that's a liberal view of the world. It's, I don't really care what other people do. Um, it's not my business. Who can, I'll get on with my life, you get on with your life. The liberals versus the authoritarians. And the authoritarians were deeply offended by that. And they are the same. So the liberals will say about a woman's right to choose abortion, for example, well, that's fine. It's got nothing to do with me. Um, if that's how you feel that um, your life and body is best served, fine, go ahead. I'm happy for it to be safe and um, publicly funded. Authoritarians don't like that. Authoritarians want to control and they want to control others. And often it's patriarchal religion that is used as the device uh, as a control device. And of course, 95, 96% of our private schools are religious schools. Mm. Once upon a time, once upon a time, the churches propped up the schools. Mm. Now it's the other way around. Now it's the other way around. The schools are propping up the churches. Without those private schools, those churches would be virtually irrelevant. Mm. Well, they would certainly have to reinvent themselves in a major way to be relevant. What they have found in Australia is a brilliant way of becoming, becoming associated with the ruling class. Mm. Because private schools, the reason parents will pay all that money for something they can, they can get down the road for free, which is pretty much the same if we mm. scratch away the marketing, um, is because they think they're buying their kids a ticket to the top end of town. In that scarcity pyramid I was talking about and the merit thing, they really mm. honestly believe I'm buying my child an advantage. Now, I totally understand parents wanting to buy their own children an advantage. That's what parenting is about. What is unforgivable is the state colluding for the more privileged parents to buy their kids further privileges. The state should actually work to against that, should actually say, well, I know you want to buy your own child an advantage, but in fact, because you're privileged, because you're well-educated, because you're concerned about your child's education, you've already given them an advantage. Mm. What we need to do is help the kids who haven't got that advantage that your children have get the same opportunity as your children have. And that's the bit. And, and what's awful about that is it's that old idea of pay, playing to the worse or the better angels of our nature. And what our public subsidies of private schools, we, we are the most generous public subsidizers of private education in the world. Nobody else does it like us. Nobody else. This is not the same anywhere in any other country. Nowhere. Um, certainly no comparable OECD mm. country. Um, and we're, we're amongst the lowest percentage of education spending on public education. So mm. this is quite wrong right from the start. But what we've done is we've basically played to parental anxiety, the fear parents have and the wish for them to buy their children an advantage over other children. That's the worst as a, those are the worst angels of our nature, not the better angels. And the trouble with that meanness is I don't think you can silo it off. If that's a, a publicly approved meanness, a kind of climbing over the heads of vulnerable kids to get your kid ahead, which is what we're doing, mm. that permeates the whole of our society. That becomes part of who Australians are. Mm. And that is terribly sad. And it corrodes us. That kind of selfishness about children and the children born most disadvantaged corrodes the entire society morally, in my view. And the churches, supposedly the moral guardians, though I've never believed that, I was also brought up in atheism, um, don't only collude in this, they benefit from it and they spend an enormous amount of time, effort, energy, money, and lobbying to perpetuate it. 
and here in 2021, we still have the same issues, as you're mentioning, that the government still seems to, you know, there's always these deals done and, and you know, I drive past some of, well, I don't drive anymore, but I'll go past the schools, these private schools where all these buildings are done up and I seem to think where does this money come from and you see you hear things that I think it was on the news a couple of months ago I think it was St Kevin's and you, you know, hear about these tennis courts and I think where does this money come from and then as you mentioned the fact that the government still they can access funds and I just think well where's the fairness when, when I've worked in schools in the western suburbs where we had to try and get computers you know, because kids, we couldn't get afford the computers. We had to have like a block of 12 to book them in and they weren't the best so the kids can have access to it. And I think where's the fairness in that? And, you know, and as you said, this competitiveness and, and even the hard work, because as a teacher, we're all, you know, we're all trained the same way. And this is what I don't understand why the public don't see that. We're not being teaching in a special school doesn't mean you're higher qualified. We're all on the same training levels so i don't and i feel like like yourself i try and explain to parents there really there is no difference it's just a facade you know you're paying for a, a, a what i call it so uh media kind of packaged you know um for ideal ideal that really doesn't exist you're paying for something that's manufactured manufactured privilege it's um it's an old advertising trick, actually, and my um, years in advertising taught me to see through this. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, how, it's how they position premium products mm. and then the house brand. So private schools are seen as the premium product. Um, and therefore, what you're giving, what you're really selling is bragging rights for parents. And there is no doubt that if you are a parent, particularly if you are a middle-class parent or what they call aspirational, and you decide to send your child to um, a public school, a local public school, you will have to defend your choice. You'll be attacked. Mm. I was, I sent my children to public schools like me and I was attacked routinely for doing so. You're sacrificing your children for your principles was one of the classic um, mm. lines of attack. And I used to say, well, A, I don't think I'm sacrificing them. But B, well, surely that's what you should do for your principles. What's the point mm -hmm. in having principles if you're not prepared to actually act on them? And what are you teaching your children about having principles if you believe that public education is great, but uh, when it comes to, oh, it's a bit tough, I'll just pay the extra money or I'll lie about my religious um, denomination mm. or even I'll lie about where I live to try to get them into the public school that people have decided is the best one. So tragically, the whole competitive nature of our schooling system, um, it actually, again, it, it, it operates to make us behave badly rather than well. And that's got to be the last thing you want an education system to do. Um, I, uh, I think it is we have made it very hard for parents and it's very hard to be a parent who decides to stand against this. But, um, and so I have, I have sympathy for people who um, feel, feel bewildered and under attack uh, for choosing public education. But at the same time, um, if they do, most of them are really happy. And in fact, you know, you will see kids who for various reasons leave the private school system and go to the public school system and go, oh, oh, this is fine. Because in a way, sometimes, and we're taught that these public schools are literally dens of iniquity. Um, mm. Partly, that's a marketing trick too, mm. because if you're going to spend 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50 thousand dollars mm. per annum on something you can get for next to nothing down the road, you have to say that what's down the road is absolutely terrible. Otherwise, what kind of an idiot are you? You know, you're an idiot. So, so there is a vested interest in slagging off the public schools if you've made a decision to go private. Mm. Um, and that is really problematic as well because that has a snowballing effect. But it's about buying um, the whole image. And, and people say to me, oh, you're always going on about that as if all private schools are high fee schools. And of course they're not. There's only about five or 10% of private schools that are very high fee. Though when we use the term high fee, High fee to who? 
you know, two or three thousand dollars a year can be very high fee for a very uh, poor family with four or five kids, you know. So high fee is a relative term. But the highest fee, which is more specific, yes, there's only a few of them, but they operate. This is how they operate in a marketing sense. Like um, the haute couture that Chanel or, um, you know, um, one of those big French fashion houses does. Now, they don't make any money out of those haute couture collections. There's only about 100 women in the world who can afford to buy those things or fit into them. What they make the money out of is the lipsticks, the skincare, the hair products, the eyeshadow, the perfumes that they sell at vastly inflated prices. So you can buy a little piece of the magic Chanel, you know, Yves Saint Laurent, Christian Dior brand. Well, that's exactly the same with your systemic Catholic schools or your lower fee Christian, etc. They are the lipstick, the um, perfume of mm-hmm. the Haute Couture, Riverviews, um, you know, Geelong Grammars and mm. Abbotsleys. It's exactly how it works. And so we've been trained to buy into these marketing ideas of what is a prestige brand and what is a house brand and to associate our own social status with the brand that we buy and the tragedy in Australia is that we have done that with our education system. I really don't care if we do it with fashion, that's fine. Fashion doesn't matter. But with our education system, that's criminal. Mm. And that's the whole um, premise, isn't it, of of that, when we look at education, who's it for, who's interests. And uh, one thing, one of the research areas I looked at is newsletters in schools, private schools versus public to see the way they're shaped and the way they're marketed to the parents. And I remember looking at one private school, I think it was um, Melbourne High. So here I go, I mentioned it, Melbourne High. And they had a section called Old Boys Association. And I thought straight away, aha, here we go. And it was this linkage where they would highlight a prominent person in position it could be law firm and it could be it, you know it was somebody that obviously is a position of privileged power and it was that sort of association that they create this as you said this mythology that somehow you are part of this 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 magical secret society where handshake that once you mention the name of your school you are likely to enter that world that special world of privilege and I thought to myself, you know, really in 2020, I think it was here, 20, why do we still do that? Why are parents sucked into this? What does it mean? What is the reality of you? You know, it's like, it's as though, is it because, like you were saying, is it because so, so we selfishly, some people want to be better than other people and using education as a way to, to mask that desire, that need for power and control? And some parents do that. What do you think, Jane? Is it, is it is it really that people really want more power and control over others? Well, some do, yes. That's true. But I think it's also anxiety. It's this idea there's not enough to go around. It goes back to that. There's not enough to go around. So I have to get by my kids as much as I possibly can. Otherwise, they might end up, you know. And so it is, it's, it, it's the protective instinct, mm-hmm. but misdirected. So what happens now, Jane, with the 21st century? We keep pushing this in education circles, that 21st century learning, 21st century skills, you know, the idea of teamwork, globalisation, digital networking. How does that play out in these spaces of private and public? How does the private school then try and dominate or take over that sort of um, space? It's interesting, isn't it? I think they use the buzzwords. Um, Mm. That's what a lot of people do. They use, and no one really knows what it means. Um, But so they just put them in their brochures and, you know, Mm. show them the banks of computers and all that kind of stuff. But in fact, public education systems are going to be much better at that kind of stuff because they're systems. Mm. So, for example, in New South Wales, I don't know so much about the other states, but in New South Wales, there is a very high tech facility that all public schools can use for network learning, for all that kind of thing, um, which can only work if it's part of a system. 
Now, the Catholic system um, may have more opportunities in that way, but most independent schools are exactly that. They actually can't do network learning particularly efficiently. They're not networked in with other schools. That's part of what they boast about. So it's a funny one to me. But to be honest with you, I've, I'm, I'm not a teacher, therefore I don't get into the curriculum um, stuff very much um, because that's not my area. But I do worry about jargon and buzzwords. As soon as something becomes the answer, the solution, everyone must do X. This is the only way forward. And we're going to test you in X. My suspicion, my years of marketing, my years in advertising is triggered. And I think to myself, never seen any one-size-fits-all solutions for things as complicated as human children. Take all of that with a huge pinch of salt. Somebody's pushing an agenda, someone's pushing a product, and someone's trying to make money. And that would be all I would say. Be guarded about all the jargon, all the buzzwords, all the bright, shiny objects that parents get. Oh, global learning, network, blah, whatever it is, digital century, blah, 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 21st century learning. Woo-hoo-hoo. Be suspicious. When I look back on my own education at Forest High back in the 70s, and I try to remember anything about the curriculum that I was taught. Remember, I did okay in the HSC, so I must have studied and learned it. I remember a couple of quotes from Shakespearean plays, one of which stood me in very good stead when I had my own children, which is from King Lear, how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. I use that against them quite often. Um, But that was about it. Otherwise, what do I remember of my um, school days? The relationships I had. The relationships I had with other students, with my teachers, um, with the school, which I loved and really enjoyed being at. The things that I picked up, the stuff I learned in the classroom, I absorbed. I didn't, I didn't think, oh, tick that learning goal off on my ten year, old, ten, year 10 list. I just, kids don't do that. So we worry a lot about the curriculum. We worry a lot about the content. My view is that's always going to change. That is always going to change. And there will be fads in education where, you know, we want to go to the more student-directed learning and the pendulum will go a bit too far that way. It'll be a bit... So then we'll come back to the more explicit, you know, teaching, three hours, nonsense. And it'll probably do this for the next however long we've got schools and kids learning. And it's doesn't really matter. What we should be concentrating on is, do the kids who come into the classroom and into the school gate with the least get the most support and help that they need to catch up with the other students? Do they get a chance to develop their own potential as much as other students? And the other thing we need to worry about is, are we allowing our students to have good, um, supportive, warm, friendly relationships with one another? And with their teachers. You're not going to like every kid in the class. You're not going to like every teacher you have. That's the way life is. But as long as you like most of them, or at least a few of them, and they like you, and you like most of you, some of your teachers, and you can tolerate most of them, that's probably fine. But that's not what we talk about. But that's actually what matters. A kid will learn in a classroom with a teacher they like. They will learn much less in a classroom with a teacher they hate. The thing is, kids can't agree on which teachers they like and which teachers they hate because they're all different too. That's why when we keep trying to simplify teaching and learning into buzzwords or one size fits all or, you know, direct instruction or any of the things, flipped classrooms, any of the things that we talk about, some of which may be really good and useful. I'm not saying they're not. We're reductive. We're trying to reduce the complexity of how children learn into things that fit on graphs. Jane, it has been an absolute pleasure hearing your story, hearing your passion for education. And I want to once again thank you so much for giving us your lived experience with your own education and really getting us to think a bit more um, deeper about buzzwords and really what 
private and public education are really about. Thank you so much for being today on our show. Thank you. Oh, thank you for asking me. It's a pleasure.